God's been good to you this week. Amen. He's been to us. Yeah, it's always good to, to me. Always been good to me. Song we sung about, I've never been sorry. Been yeah. uh, saved uh, this coming February for 40 years. God's been good to me every single day. My day has gone by. And he has blessed me and been good to me. And uh, I can truly say I've never been sorry. Amen. 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 The devil, he's always lied to me. He's always trying to deceive me. Yes, he and his promises are always, always empty. And, uh, a little bit of truth the whole lot of life. Right. And, uh, it's never come through with anything he said. And uh, thank God that the Lord's been good to us. Well, this past uh, Sunday, the preacher uh, had mentioned uh, Brother Scott's uh, sermon, which he did a great job on the Eagles. And the preacher said that he had texted uh, Brother Scott and told him he did a great job and texted him. And I said, well, well, the Lord's leading me and there is no way the preacher is going to text me and give me a thumbs up. I just know it. I don't have a text. I don't have a phone. So, <laughs> I did a snail mail. <laughs> you don't have internet either. <laughs> yeah, just send it to Hannah and she'll send it to Hannah. Yeah. I'm just joking. But anyway, now you can stand. First Kings, chapter 17. chapter 17. Okay. Verse 1, it says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, um, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook uh, Sheba, that is, before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Chirah, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. Since we have already prayed, we just got to be praying. You can go ahead and have a seat. As Brother Scott said, uh, when he preached, the uh, pastor gave us a, a verse and a phrase, uh, at least in my particular verse, he gave me a phrase, uh, in the verse, and my verse is verse 4. And it says, And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. My phrase was the ravens to feed thee. The ravens to feed thee, if I'm not mistaken. And after the preacher uh, gave, gave us that back here in the room over here, and I began the next day, began to look at that and study it, and and uh, uh, to see where the Lord would have me to go with this. I don't know if this is what the preacher was thinking or, or the direction that he was hoping I would go. I don't know. Uh, but this is where the Lord was leading me. And so we'll go from there. Uh, the first mention of the word raven found in the word of God is found in Genesis chapter 8, verse 7. You have to turn there. This is where uh, after the flood, Noah sends out a raven. And did it come back? Didn't come back. Then he sent out a dove and so forth. But I do want you to turn over to the book of Leviticus. Because we're going to look at some things about the raven real briefly. And then, uh, then we'll be going into the message. The book of Leviticus, chapter 11. This is the second mention of the word raven. And when we get to the right chapter. Chapter 11 and verse 13. It says, And these are they which ye 
shall have in abomination among the fowls. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle and the ostrich, uh, offerings, whatever it is, ostrich, and the osprey and the vulture and the kite after his time. Every raven after his time. And the owl and the night hawk and the cock crow, I guess, and how you say that, I don't know, and the hawk after his time. And the little owl and the cormorant and the great owl and the swan and the pelican and the deer eagle and the stork, the heron after her kind and the lapwing and the bat. So we see this is a list of fowls. There's 20 different birds here that are listed that are called an abomination. That God says, hey, don't eat them. They're an abomination. Well, the same list is basically given over in Deuteronomy chapter 14. You don't have to turn there. Verses 11 through 20. The same list. And it says that they're unclean. It says they're unclean. Eleven times the word raven or raveness is mentioned, or ravens is mentioned uh, in the word of God. I've just given you three of them. Uh, actually, four of the ones found in verse Kings. The other one, uh, Sober Solomon also tells us that a raven is black. How many of you know that? It's really easy, right? <laughs> any any of y'all ever saw the movie, the thing, Alfred Hitchcock made the birds? <laughs> and Proverbs chapter 30, verse 17, another mention of the word raven is given. And it talks about uh, the children who mock their parents. And uh, children that don't obey their mother. It says that the raven will pluck out their eyes. It says the eagle will eat their flesh. It tells you a little bit about a raven as well as eagle. Okay. And Psalms 147 verse 9. Fowls or birds are included with beasts. They're lumped together in the same category. No difference. In the book of Job 3841. God provides food for the raven, though. Even though he's an abomination, even though he's an unclean fowl, God provides food for the raven, also as well in the book of Luke. So there, basically, is all the mentions of every time the word raven or ravens is mentioned in the word of God. Now turn back over to 1 Kings. 1 Kings, chapter 17 again. Here's the story of Elijah. And he has just said that it's not going to rain. And so the Lord goes to him, or comes to him in verse 2, and told him to go by the brook that is before Jordan. And that's what he does. God provides him water through the brook. And then God says in verse 4, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. So he provides him water. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Ravens is more than one. So there's more than one unclean bird here fixing to feed the man of God. So he went, in verse 5, and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went well by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. So he had bread and he had flesh. Now the word raven, the word raven, it means to devour with great eagerness. To devour with great e eagerness. To obtain with violence, furiously, viciously, eager for prey or gratification. Basically, a raven is a carnival. It, it eats flesh. Yes, sir. If it's not dead, it'll make it dead if it can. Yeah. That's why you see these birds sometimes on the road eating what something is roadkill. It's like we call it. you know the redneck. You know they want that roadkill go cook. But you know if you don't get there first, the raven they get it, or the vultures, or sometimes you'll see a hawk. Because they're flesh-eating birds, they're fowls. 
And the way they attack, according to Webster, is they devour with great eagerness to obtain with violence. That's what you have to do sometimes to kill something. Yeah. To be ferocious, vicious, <coughs> eager for prey or gratification. The word unclean as described here in Deuteronomy of the rape. The word unclean, guess what that means? No. Not clean. Oh man, we got some real smart people tonight. <laughs> Be careful. Real smart. Not clean. Boy. It also means foul, dirty, filthy. It also means ceremonially, ceremoni ceremonially impure. Not cleansed by ritual practices. This bird was never to be used as a sacrifice to God. It didn't make no difference. What they did to the bird, well, as well as the other birds that are listed, they could not be used as a sacrifice to God. Because it couldn't be clean. That means they could wash it. It might be a, an eagle or a hawk or an owl or a raven that was in perfect condition. Nothing wrong. But you still couldn't use it because it was considered unclean. No matter what you did, you could not use it. There are over 30 different fowls or birds mentioned in the Bible. And I did read the same article uh, a few weeks earlier than the preacher um, that Peter Ruckman wrote about birds. And I actually have a bird message. Maybe I'll preach one day. Um, what kind of bird are you? And it kind of goes along with that same idea I've had for some, quite some time, but never preached it. But there are 30 different fowls or birds mentioned in the Bible, and just about every one of them represent a devil. Yes, every time it occurs. Not every time, but many times. Now, in 1 Kings chapter 17, what we see is what the Lord led me in the direction is that God uses unclean animal. God used an unclean animal to do his bidding. He used an unclean bird to perform his work to the man of God. Now why didn't he get a different bird or a different animal? Well, why didn't he just drop it out of the sky like he did when he provided man? Why did he use a raven? Well, I guess there's a lot of guesswork we could say. I don't know if I know all the right reasons. But what God led me to see is that God uses unclean things in His Word. And the fact I want to give you tonight this idea is that we are all unclean. <coughs> Every single one. Amen. We're all unclean. And we're going to look at some of those examples in the Bible. And then we'll go from there and make application. Look over at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And we're going to read a few verses here. Now this is Paul talking to the church. Or to the Jews, I realize. But it is church doctrine. And it certainly applies to me. In chapter 3, it says in verse 9, it says, What then? Are we better than they? And he's talking to the Jews. It says, Are we, including himself, are we better than they, they being the Gentiles? <coughs> they were talking about circumcision here. Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are. All under sin. We can all agree on that. Yeah. We're all born in sin. As it is written, now this is a translation from Hebrew to Greek here in the Psalms. <laughs> Psalms chapter 14 and Psalms 53. And he quotes it, Paul says, There is none righteous, no, not one. Jew or Gentile, there is no one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. 
Their throat is an open sepulcher. Now that would show you that you're unclean. You ever seen a sepulcher or a grave? Or they steam? If you were to open up a sepulcher after someone's been buried, like remember when Lazarus, hey, you know, Lord, he stinketh. He's been there. Well, imagine opening a sepulcher and, and the maggots and the, and, the and the stink. And that's what the Bible describes as our throat, is as an open sepulcher. And Paul included himself in that. We. Well, we too. As, as it goes on, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. I realize this talks to the Jews. I understand that also applies to me and I can look at my own life and say, boy, I've been this way just about in every way, over and over and over. And I'm sure you can too. Verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And all the world is guilty before God. When we're comparing ourselves to God, we're all guilty. Yeah. We're clean. Amen. Verse 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God. Amen. Now the righteousness of God. Without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe their salvation. But there is no difference. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile when it comes to salvation. Here you can see that God does not respect a person in this regard. When it comes to salvation, we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. Verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Turn over to Psalms. Here we saw that Paul included himself. <coughs> Psalms chapter 51 is saying that he was a sinner just like everybody else. Even though he was a Jew. Here we look at Psalms chapter 51 and this is the psalm that David wrote after he was caught in adultery and after he murdered a man. Two sins that demanded punishment by death, as the preacher has pointed out. But God had mercy. He is a respecter of person. And in verse 1, it says, David prayed and said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude." Of thy tender mercies blot out my transgressions. Wash me. A person who needs to be washed is dirty. How many of you have taken a bath or a shower since Sunday? A couple of you haven't. That's better. Come on, man. Okay. I took a shower tonight before I come to church. You know what? Because I was dirty. Today being, Brother Collison's working on his truck. We got kerosene all over us and diesel fuel and grease. And, you know, we were dirty. We need to be washed. That's why sin is. We all have had sin on us. We all need to be washed. It says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Sin will dirty your life. Sin has dirtied my life. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Verse 7, 
purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. If you were to continue and read up the whole chapter, I think it's 19 verses here, you would see, you know what? David was in sin. That's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, I sin and I need to be cleansed. Now David was a great man. He was the greatest king that Israel ever had. But yet, God used David in spite of his sin, in spite of his adultery, in spite of his murder and having blood upon his hands, God used him. He was a sinner, just like me and you. It's obvious by this Psalms. <coughs> Turn over to Psalms 119 in verse 9. Now this verse, whether you're young or old, male or female, can use this verse in your life. In verse 9, it says, Wherewithal? That basically means how. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? That's a good question. But old men need it as well. Young women need it. Old women need it. Everybody needs to know how to cleanse their way. You know, the older I get, the more I, I realize sometimes, you know, I think of some things that come to my mind. I say, man, that happened when I was younger. I said, Lord, I, I don't think I've ever asked you to forgive me. I don't know about it, no. And I said, Lord, forgive me for that. I don't know if I've ever asked you to forgive me. And it bothers me. And then I asked him to forgive me. You know what? Then it's under the blood. I've been cleansed of that. It also helps me when I ask this question in my life to help keep my way cleansed. And what is the thing here that helps a young man cleanse his way? By taking he thereto according to thy word. It's God's word that is a cleansing agent. Amen. The more you read it, the more you study it, the more you meditate it upon it, the more you rightly divide the word of truth, the more you hide it in your heart, but I might not sin against me. <coughs> Boy, it, it helps me. It helps you, I'm sure. If you, if you stay in this book, it'll help you. Keep your life clean and keep your path pure. But the fact is, the reason why we need cleansing is because we are sinners. Yeah. And if you are saved, you're, yes, you've been clothed in God's righteousness. But yet, we still need cleansing every single day. Look over at 1 John 1 9. I know we all can quote this verse, but look at it anyway. 1 John 1 9. Now this verse is not written to try to win people to the Lord. It's written to people that are saved. That have already been saved. Now why would God give us a verse like this unless we need to be cleansed? David. It says in verse 9, If we confess our sins, He, talking about God, is faithful. Not the Pope, not the priest, not the preacher. But He, God, Jesus Christ, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow, that's great. I'm glad God put that in there. I'm glad God just didn't save me and said, that's it. You don't have to give an account for all your sins from here on out. And it is true, we don't have to give an account, but God does forgive us. God does put that under the blood if we ask Him. It says, if we confess our sins. Look at verse 7. Back up to verse 7. It says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. I'm thankful that I can say, Lord, I claim the blood for this sin. 
I know I've come to you a hundred times, but I'm thankful that you will forgive me. I can repent of that and get it under the blood, Amen. and I'm cleansed. Now, look over at 2 Corinthians 7.1. 2 Corinthians 7.1. Just making spiritual application here. It says, having therefore, Paul says, these promises, dearly beloved, let us, he includes himself again, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. You know what Paul's saying here? I'm filthy. We need to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness. Remember over in Thessalonians, it says, from even the appearance of evil. It also says flee fortification and so forth. Filthiness. He says cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Paul included himself in that when he said that. Let us. He didn't say you should do it. He said we should do it. He included himself as being unclean. Now, you don't have to turn back there. In 1 Kings, chapter 17, verse 4, the <coughs> ravens to feed him. Here we have an unclean bird to feed the man of God. God used an unclean animal to do his work. To perform an unnatural thing, actually. Because a raven would normally kill the flesh or find the flesh or dead carcass or animal and rip it to pieces and eat it himself. He would not take it to someone. That's very unnatural. Very unusual. But God, in His sovereignty, He told the raven what to do, and the raven obeyed. Yeah. Now, as I said earlier, we are all unclean. As I told you about David, we looked at Paul in two verses. God tells us over and over. Throughout the Word of God, these are just some of the examples I pulled up and looked at and read and thought about. I want to look back at the definition of the word raven or ravens. It means to devour <coughs> with great eagerness, to obtain with violence, furiously, vicious, Eager for prey or gratification. Now I want to present to you tonight that this is very much like that sometimes. Let's read it again. It means to devour with great eagerness. To obtain with violence. To be furious, vicious, eager for prey or gratification. To devour one another. To destroy something. Brother Lee has been trying to teach me something. And like Craig said, <coughs> sometimes we're hard headed. We have characteristics like uh, goat. Ever since uh, Brother Lee came to Amazing Grace Baptist Church, where I was pastor, and where we started the church. He, he began to try to teach me something and tell me something. I didn't quite grasp a lot of it then, but a few weeks ago we were talking about something. And I began to grasp a little bit more of it, a little bit more of it, and hopefully I'm just about done. And he'll probably be happy to hear that. But uh, a couple of years ago when I had him to preach uh, for me, you know, we were talking and sharing some things and he asked me how long I've been in the area, and who did I know, and he asked me, did I know you, and Bingham Heights, I said, no, at the time I didn't know y'all, or nothing about you, and, and I said, no, I don't know them, and he said, well, you need to come to my meeting, we're supposed to be having in the, in the in the winter, and so forth, and I said, well, I sure certainly will, I'll be happy to be there. And then I found out, you know, he was a member here, and I said, man, that's great, and I figured I'd come more often, and, uh, and then uh, he said, well, do you know this brother, and, uh, do you go to this meeting? Or do you go here or there? And do you know this, this certain gentleman or evangelist? Maybe you should have him in. And I knew some of the men that uh, he was 
talking about. And I said, well, no, he, you know, we're, we're different on this. And, and, uh, and uh, he said, well, what about this place or that place or this camp meeting or this revival? And I said, well, I've heard about that and this and that. And he stopped me. And he said, brother, he said, if you are not careful, he said, I can tell by your answers and your attitude. You know how Brother Lee is, you know. Oh, goodness. Because <laughs> uh, I thought I was giving the right answer. I thought I was giving the right information. He said, if you're not careful, he said, you will die a slow death. And everybody and everything around you will die with you. He said, you cannot, he said, being a pastor or planting a church is not a, being a long ranger. He said, you cannot be an island to yourself either. He said, you cannot cut off all your friendships or relationship with somebody because you don't line up with them 100%. I said, okay. I said, well, I thought just the opposite. He said, no. He said, you cannot do that. A few weeks ago, and so I took his advice, and I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll think about that and, and consider those things, and we went on. Well, a few weeks ago, uh, I had asked him to do something for me down in South Carolina, uh, contact somebody, and he did, and, you know, it don't really matter about the details. But he had talked with the preacher that I had uh, known years ago and so forth, and um, the preacher, I guess, uh, when Brother Lee was talking with him, had said that the church was growing and, and uh, they but think about knocking out walls and building more because they got four or five hundred people there and you know they got a camp now and so many so, so many other things and uh, and so and I said, well, as we was talking over the fellowship hall, he was relaying some of the essence. He said, uh, he said he seems to be a really really good guy. I said, well, and then I began to point out a couple of things where we were different, even with Brother Lee or with this church. And Brother Lee, he stopped me again. And I remember that look. And I remember, oh, goodness, I got to go through this again. I didn't get it the first time, I can tell. And so he said, brother, he said, you should not be judging that man's ministry. And I said, uh, why not? And I said, he, he's... He's, he's different even slightly on the King James and, and I know that he associates with certain people and and uh, like and I named two or three people. <laughs> and he stuck his finger. <laughs> I said, oh, I knew I was in trouble then. He stuck that finger out. And he said, you will become a legalist and pointing out everything that everybody does wrong that don't line up with you and he said, that is wrong. And he said, as he went on, <clears throat> he said, you cannot, Beth was sitting there, the last thing will be, you know, if you'll be confronted, you want to be done behind the scenes, not in front of your wife, you know, at least the kids were there. But anyway, uh, he said, you do not want to judge another man's ministry. He said, that, that man that you asked me to talk with, he said, maybe he don't line up like you. Maybe he don't believe in the rapture or the, or the, or the millennium like you do. But he said, so what? He said, God is blessing his work. He said, boy, they're, they're having a bunch of people saying. He said, you know how many people they had go out on visitation? He said, they had like 150 people. He said, can you compare to that? He said, no. He said, be, be quite careful judging God's man. He said, you may not line up like that. He said, but you should do that. I said, well, are you telling me that if a man disagreed with you slightly in a certain area or, or you were going to a church and, and, uh, and someone that you knew was going to preach and you, you wouldn't have to preach? He said, no. He said, we're not talking about major doctrine. He said, I'm talking about Things that really don't matter. He said, I wouldn't have a problem with that. He said, it wouldn't be none of my business anyway. But he said, 
You need to be careful judging other men's work because God has used great men down through the centuries that are different than you. And he said, I'm talking about great men that thousands of people have been saved. And he said, maybe that man that you're talking about has not had the training that you've had. Have you thought about that? He said, then he made it personal. And he said, have you always thought the way you do? He said, no. He said, have you grown any in your life? I said, sure. He said, what if you was introduced to the things that you know now as a Christian? And you was introduced 20 years from now or before. Would you accept them? I said, no way. He said, okay. He said, maybe that pastor has it. He's not ready to accept those things. Maybe that's why God hasn't brought those things into his life. Maybe he's not clear on the doctrine of the rapture or the millennium or, or the dispensations or even the King James Bible, he said. He said, but that don't mean God's not using him. He said, from what he tells me, he said, I've been there and I preached and I even did a, a, an album there years ago and he said, he said, it's a thriving church. He said, it's growing he said, yeah, they may not line up exactly. But he said, that doesn't mean that God's not using them. I said, okay. I really begin to think about that a whole lot. In my own life, my own ministry. And I begin to think back over some preachers and some people and even some ministries that aren't exactly lined up with me. And God brought to memory the verse that the preacher gave me, I guess about four weeks ago now, about the ravens to feed him and how God, it showed me about God using unclean things. And some people, I guess, because they don't line up with us, we might say, they're unclean. Just like Peter Upton called Brother Tab a heretic. Well, we don't think he's a heretic. But yet some people might call him a heretic. We might actually call some people unclean. Or, man, they're, they're wrong. Such as, would y'all all agree that Fanny Crosby was used of God? Sure, I don't think anybody in here would say Fanny Crosby wasn't used of God. But you know what? She didn't line up with us. She wasn't a Baptist. But yet God used her to write over 3,000 songs. Many of them we sing in our hymn book. Would we call her unclean? Well, certainly she was. She's a sinner just like us. But God used her in his work, in the ministry, in our hymn book, in our churches. What about Dale Moody? He wasn't a Baptist. He certainly was used of God. Had great revivals of people saved. What about John and Charles Weston? They have songs in the hymn book as well. They wasn't Baptists, they were Methodists. But would anybody deny that God did not use these men in a great and wonderful way? Now, what about Spurgeon? Spurgeon was a Baptist. He certainly had some different beliefs than we do. And we certainly don't line up with him on every little thing. <clears throat> but you can't say that God didn't use Spurgeon. He had 25,000 people. I don't preach to talk about mega churches. That would be a mega church to me, I guess. I don't know. And God certainly used Spurgeon. And I'm not con contradicting what preachers say. The point is, Spurgeon didn't line up with us exactly. Dale Moody didn't line up. Fanny Crosby. Now let's bring it a little bit closer. As the preacher read, and again, I'm contradicting what he said, J. Frank Norris was certainly wrong when he corrected the John 3.16. Uh, he was certainly wrong if he, in my opinion, if he didn't even believe in the rapture and, and he wasn't uh, right on the uh, millennium and so forth. He was certainly wrong. I'm not saying that he wasn't. But he was used of God in spite of him being different. In spite of him being a raven, if you will. Lester Roloff. Lester Roloff had some real funny beliefs. You know, most of the time what you hear is what you hear on the radio. Great preacher. 
You know, we got DVDs of him and so forth. I got bunches and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of his sermons are great. But he had some weird teachings. Just like the wire ring glasses, you know. He believed it was a sin to drink soda. How many of y'all drove soda this week? Uh, well, y'all sin to go into that's wrong. How many of you put some deodorant on this week? Well, you just sin to go into that's wrong. Isn't that kind of weird? Kind of strange? But that's what he believed. To chew, chew gum. Can't chew gum. No gum, John. Or you're in sin. And there's some other issues that we certainly disagree with on Lester Rolla. But how many of us would say, oh, God, God used Lester Rolla? Certainly he did. He was a little different in some beliefs. Now I'm going to name one here. John R. Rice. He was not writing the King James Bible. That is for sure. If you've ever read his book on the Bible, the God Read book, he corrects the King James Bible over and over and over. Anybody ever read it? No, preacher probably has. Anybody else? Anyway, no, brother Scott. He corrects the Bible. Now he started the Sword of the Lord many, many years ago, and he was wrong when he corrected the Word of God. But the sword of the Lord has blessed many people over the years. Thousands of people have been saved. When he died, Curtis Hudson took over. He didn't do much better. He was from the New King James. Correcting the Word of God once again. He was wrong. But yet God used the sword of the Lord to see thousands of people saved. All down through the years. Curtis Hudson died. And then you have Shelton Smith. And Shelton Smith does believe the King James Bible is inspired, preserved, infallible, and in error. He said that way before um, Before I had the newspaper. Uh, not say way before, it was before, uh, after, I'm sorry, after Jack Scott came out and said he's junk at Hiles Anderson years ago, a couple years ago. So he made it very clear where the soul of the Lord now stands. He said, we used to believe something else, but now we believe this. I think that's a good turnaround. He believes the Word of God. Thousands of people have been saved from the sword of the Lord. Just because something starts bad does not make it bad now. Anybody know? I know a couple of you do. Because I told you. How many of you know where the first soup kitchen started? Who started it? You may know. You'll never guess, I'm sure. Al Capone. Al Capone started the first soup kitchen. For the wrong reasons. For the wrong intentions. But now today there are soup kitchens around. And there's some real good ones. Does that make all soup kitchens bad? Because it started wrong? No. Jack Howells. Was Jack Howells a perfect man? No. He was unclean just like me and you. Just like Garner Rice and the rest of them. Jack Howells started believing like many people. He believed the scholars just like Spurgeon did in his day when they changed the Word of God. Later on in his life, though, he corrected that as best he could and did stand for the King James. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches have been started through Howells Anderson. Thousands of people have been saved. But yet, Jack Howells was a man just like me and you. He didn't line up with me and you perfectly. Was he perfect? No. He was unclean. But God uses unclean people. And just like Brother Lee was trying to teach me. He said, Mark, be careful before you judge God's man. Just because you don't agree with him on something. Because he's still God's man. Just like our pastor. I'm sure everybody here don't agree with the preacher on every little life. But you do be careful of judging. Because he is still God's man. Just like another church, it might be a little bit different than ours. I ain't talking about someone teaching another gospel. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about not teaching the deity of Christ. I'm not talking about salvation called another way. I'm talking about things that sometimes don't really matter a whole lot. 
God uses unclean things. And the fact is, we're all unclean. Preacher preached, I don't know, a month or so ago. Well, what has God saved you, not only in, what he's, has He saved you from? And He encouraged us to think during that message and even afterwards about where would you be? Where would you be if God hadn't saved you? Well, we'd all be in hell. That's where we'd be. We all could be more mixed up on our doctrine. Who knows? I thank God of where I was raised, and the people that my lives have crossed. If I, my life had crossed here 20 years ago, I don't know if I would have accepted some of the things that I do believe now on dispensation because of our passion. I probably would have thought he was a heretic, to be honest with you. I would have. The rage to feed them. That's what God said. Because I've sent the rage to feed them. And I guess in some of our circle, we might consider some of these people I mentioned, and others, as rage. But God has used many of those men and women and ministries to feed a lot of people. To get the gospel out to millions of people. Hundreds of thousands of people to be saved. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of churches to be started. God uses the unclean. I encourage you tonight to think about your life. You know, sometimes, as the preacher has mentioned uh, in the last, even tonight, I think, but sometimes I've been this way. You know, knowledge will puff you up. It'll puff you up. It's puffed me up before. You think, like when Brother Lee talked to me, I was a little puffed up. You know, Look, I, I line up with all these things. And some, all these other people that line up with me. Look, they're big. They're in clean. He brought me down to size. He popped my balloon. And he said, you're not as righteous as you think you are. And you're wrong. And I was wrong. I have been wrong. So, think about God using you as unclean. You think about your own life and what God has saved you in and saved you from. And yet God still uses you. Nobody knows you like you and God. You know, we can all sit here in our good dress clothes and look righteous and sing our hymn, carry our King James Bible. But we know me. We know me. We know us. I know me. And you know what? God still uses me. I've told you this before and I'll share it real briefly. Again, I was raised in a Christian home, a preacher's home, and yes, it was a fundamental. I was a mean little boy after I got saved. I got saved, I know I got saved. I trusted Christ as my Savior. But two or three years later, I got into a lot of mischief. We lived right beside a Christian school. And the church was on the same grounds. And we lived in the parsonage, even though my dad was the associate pastor. Well, little boy, not going to school during summer. Boy, he has a lot to do. And so I like this break thing. Okay? I just, to be honest with you. I like, I like to break things. So I used to, by now. Okay? <laughs> And, you know, the le electric meter, you know, has a glass go on I want to bust that every week. You know, I don't know how many times I bust that thing. Just for pure meanness. They also have school. ABC school. And I was part of it during school time. 
But during the summertime, there wasn't nobody to play with there. There was a liquor store next door. There was a major highway in front of us. I had no friends, nobody to play with. But you know what? I didn't make it right. What I did, and I did this over and over and over, I broke into this school as a nine-year-old little boy. I took a rock or a brick, and I would throw it through the back door, <coughs> reach in and hit the bar and go through the school and do what I wanted to do. Mess up some stuff, steal some stuff, just plunder. And we eventually moved from there, and years later, I went back and made it right. I told them what I did. You know what? They forgave me. They charged me one penny. I offered to pay for it. You made things right. They said, no. They said, you're forgiven. I was a mean little boy. Got a lot of mischief, other things. But God protected me. During one of those break-ins, I went into a filing cabinet. I guess some little kid or somebody brought some shotgun shells to school one day. Not knowing any better. They didn't bring a gun, brought the shells. So I didn't know what shotgun shells were. I had no idea. I just thought, wow, what's that? It was like something neat. So I took them. And when I left the building, there's a big clay pit out behind our house. And I went out there and I looked at them. I threw them up in there and caught them for a while. My glove, that got boring. And I could hear them shaking. I said, what in the world is this in here? I just got to get this open. And so what I did, I took the shotgun shell with the part that strikes the, the pin, or the, I guess the silver part, or whatever you want to call it. And I had it in my hand like this, you know. And I took a rock. And I started beating that thing. And I just beat it, and I beat it, and I beat it. I bet I hit that thing 30 times. With a rock, big rock, in my hand. And all I can do, that thing should have blew up, blew my hand off, and blew up in my face. Well, the first one didn't blow up. And I had no idea, and I said, boo, this one, I can't get open, so I threw it away. So I'm going to bang it on the second one. Got 30 more times. And God said, you know, boy, I've, I've been really kind to that boy. Boy, I've been real merciful. Boy, he was extra merciful on the second one. Still nothing happened. Years later now, I'm a preacher. I've been saved for 40 years. I don't know how many gospel tracts I've handed out. I want almost 100 people to the Lord. I'm not bragging. I'm trying to make a point. I was a mean little boy that didn't deserve mercy or grace or loving kindness or forgiveness or a second or a third or a fourth or a fifth or a sixth chance. But I thank God he was patient with me. And he went the extra mile. And even the extra, extra mile. To say, he's unclean. He's filthy. Boy, he's filthy. So I got a purpose for him somewhere down the road. I'm going to use him to feed somebody. I'm going to use him to give out some gospel facts. I'm going to give him to share the gospel with somebody. And be a blessing to somebody. And be a help to somebody. Even though he's unclean. I'm going to use it. You know, this neighborhood's full of people just like that. They are. And they need somebody to be patient and care and understand. If we don't, those are the people that's going to take the build church. If we don't, we're going to fade away. Go boy. Well, that's what will give me.